delighted to be here with you this morning to share the message of God's Word with you. And today we'll focus on that simple message of Christ crucified and what a glorious message it is. We preach, we proclaim, we talk about Christ crucified. It uh, weaves its way through all the scripture lessons. Our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah proclaims the good news of salvation and what joy it produces. And then our gospel lesson is that familiar account of the prodigal son and the grace that was bestowed upon <coughs> him by his father. And then our sermon text from Corinthians. That's the one where Paul simply does say, we preach Christ crucified. That's a thought that will guide us today, and we'll open with our first song, Lift High the Cross. Fall into sin or run into any kind of danger. In all we do, 
direct us to do what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we gain light in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Take heart. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And join me in a psalm reading. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was half as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. Many are the woes of the wicked. But the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <coughs> Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds. But we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson today is the Old Testament selection taken from Isaiah chapter 12, the first six verses. In this brief reading, Isaiah mentions or uses the name of the Lord, L-O-R-D, in all capital letters. Now, that's the name that communicates that he is the God of grace, the God of forgiveness. And of course, uh, that message of forgiveness and grace is what removes fear, removes anger, <laughs> replaces it with joy and a desire to tell others. This is the message Isaiah has for his people. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Here ends our first scripture lesson. 
Our gospel for today is Luke chapter 15, familiar account of the prodigal son, the, the son who wasted the inheritance, first of all demanded his portion of the inheritance, then went away and wasted it, but the father welcomes him back in love. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear <laughs> Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. <clears throat> after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with <coughs> compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is fine. Let's unite our voices now and Jesus sinners does receive.
Savior Jesus. Amen. The section of God's Word that guides our thoughts today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, I'll begin verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Here ends the word. Please be seated. <coughs> Dear friends in Christ, in the scriptures, God tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. Oh, how true that is. So often, the way people behave, not the way God would behave, what people think, it's usually not what God would think, and the things people value, they're not always what God values. Clearly, our ways are not his ways. <clears throat> We find a striking and a sad example of that truth in our scripture text for today. Like all people everywhere, the, the folks living there in the Greek town called Corinth, they were searching for some sort of a message that brought meaning to life, you know, that, that pulled everything together, an outlook on life. Let's call it their worldview. They were looking for a worldview that helped them make sense of it all. So, what were they looking for? What did they value? What seemed to be important to them? Well, two answers emerged. Each answer came from, or applied to, a specific ethnic group. You, you may know this, but the Corinthian congregation was predominantly made up of two ethnic groups. You had a group of Jewish people, and then you had some Greeks, of course, since Corinth is part of Greece. Now, obviously, there were going to be many other ethnic groups represented there. Corinth was a cosmopolitan town, people coming and going. It's a port city, so there are going to be all kinds of folks represented. But predominantly, Jews and Greeks. So, in our reading for today, Paul speaks directly to each of these groups. I suppose you could say he asks a simple question. What is it you're looking for? As you formulate your worldview, your approach to life, what is it you're looking for? You know, that question has great application for us today. Ours. Is a culture on the hunt for meaning. Our culture is searching for a basic principle that will guide people through life. So let's listen in on the wisdom Paul shared with the Corinthian congregation. Well, we'll use a simple theme. We preach Christ crucified. Or maybe more directly, preach Christ crucified. Preach Christ crucified. Share the message. 
Why? Because it is a message of power and it is a message of wisdom. Those are the two thoughts that Paul lays before the Corinthians. Well, let's begin with the power part of it. Christ crucified, a message of power. The Jews apparently were looking for some display of power. In our reading, Paul put it this way, Jews demand miraculous signs. Displays of power. You know that the religious history of the Jewish people was rich in miracles, wasn't it? Think of all the miracles you learned about in your Sunday school days from the Old Testament. Let's go way back to the time of Moses. The exodus from Egypt. Ten displays of power and plagues, right? Where God firmly said, let my people go. And then when the Israelites did go out and they came to that Red Sea, what happened? The waters parted before them. They walked through on dry ground when Pharaoh and army tried to follow. Of course, the water came crashing down. And those soldiers dressed in their battle gear, they couldn't swim for sure. A display of power. But it didn't stop there. There was water from the rock, manna from heaven, healing from snake bites, the list goes on and on. All kinds of miracles during the days of Moses, displays of power. But it doesn't end, the miracles don't end, with Moses. Let's move on in history to the day of the prophets. Think of people like Elijah or Elisha. And then the other prophets, all kinds of miracles. During the days of Elijah, there was that showdown on Mount Carmel, right? Between the prophets of Baal and then Elijah. The prophets of Baal called on their false deity all day long, no answer. Finally, Elijah called upon the Lord. And fire immediately fell and consumed that sacrifice. A display of power. Then there was uh, that, that flour and oil that was not used up during the famine. Or think about the widow of Shunem's son who was raised from the dead. Or the marvelous departure of Elijah, swept up with the horses and chariot and fire. My goodness, the, the days of the prophets were days of miracles. But it doesn't stop there. Move on to the day of the judges. They the judges. When you and I hear the word judge, we think of somebody seated in a courtroom listening to some legal debate. That, that's not what the Bible means when it talks about judges. These were the, the deliverers, the rescuers, people raised up to deliver the Israelites. For example, maybe you think of Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges. God used him to miraculously rescue the Israelites from the Midianites. Just a handful of soldiers against this large army. Do you remember what Gideon prayed for before the battle? He said, Lord, I want a sign that you're with me. I'm going to set this fleece on the ground. And tomorrow morning, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. All right. Exactly what happened. And then Gideon said, One more sign, Lord, please. Let's do the opposite. Make the ground wet and the fleece dry. That's exactly what happened. Power. The Lord displayed his power. Another judge, but then Samson, you probably remember the most famous story of all from his life, <coughs> the end of his life, right? Chained between two pillars, he prays for superhuman strength and then pulls those pillars down and the building collapses. Power. Displays of power at the time of the judges. But it doesn't stop there. Move on to the day of the kings. King David miraculously overcame that giant soldier Goliath. Yes, he wasn't quite king yet. He was a shepherd boy, I know. But he became king. Or think of King Hezekiah. He prayed that the Lord would deliver his people. And during the night, the Lord 
executed a number of Assyrian soldiers. The army was wiped out. All kinds of displays of power. Friends, the, the Old Testament miracles go on and on and on. You, you could probably add a couple more that, that are your favorite Bible stories. The point is, the history of Israel is rich in miracles. The people of Jesus' day, they'd grown up listening to all those Bible stories. And so, when Jesus came saying that he was the Messiah, they wanted a display of power. The scripture says that the Pharisees, that's the spiritual leaders, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. And then Matthew, or John, excuse me, adds that in general, the people said, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority? And you and I hear that. And we think, well, didn't he give them some signs some miracles? Well, yes, of course he did. He turned water into wine, multiplied the bread, healed the sick, raised the dead. The list goes on and on. But apparently that was not enough. They wanted more. And so one time when they were demanding signs, this is what Jesus said. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But those words, of course, he was talking about Holy Week, wasn't he? He would suffer and die and rise again. And there was the problem. He would die. Jesus would be crucified. A Savior who dies. Oh, how weak the people thought. Many were not looking for that kind of a Savior. They did not want somebody who would meekly allow the soldiers to lead him away. They did not want somebody who would humbly allow himself to be executed. They did want a Savior who would boot out the Romans. They did want a powerful Savior who would usher in a day of prosperity. Somebody who died on the cross? That seemed too weak. Interesting, isn't it? The most powerful instrument for good, that's the cross. The most powerful instrument for good was rejected by those searching for power. Think of how powerful the cross is. Through the cross, Jesus overcame sin. Through the cross, Jesus destroyed the devil. Through the cross, Jesus set free those who were destined for separation, eternal separation from all that is good. What power was masked there in the cross? Preach Christ crucified. It truly is a message of power for the salvation of everyone who believes. The, the Jews, they were looking for displays of power. Power still tugs at many, doesn't it? In our culture, in our day, power is still enticing. Power, influence, control. It's still very enticing. The concept... Jesus being treated the way he was, that, that's not appealing. The idea that I cannot impact my eternal fate, oh, that seems so weak, so helpless, so hopeless. Such uh, helplessness, such an out-of-my-control message, well, that, that's not appealing today. People want power. Well, by God's grace, you and I share the most powerful message of all, Christ crucified. Jesus willingly set aside his glory, took on a human nature, <coughs> lived and died and rose again to set us free. This is the most powerful message of all. I urge you to hang on to it. With all your might, don't let it go. Hang on to this message of power. Do not 
be swayed by some other alleged message that gives you some sort of control in life. Hang on to Christ crucified and share that message. Share the message. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Share the message. Message of Christ crucified. First, it is a message of power. Paul goes on to say it's also a message of wisdom. Wisdom. Remember, the, the people to whom Paul was speaking, some of them, many of them were Greeks. The Greeks had a rich history of philosophers, deep thinkers, right? The Israelites, they had a rich history of miracles. The Greeks had a rich history in philosophy. I remember taking a philosophy course in college. I can still see the book. It's navy blue. It's titled Socrates to Sartre. Oh, just the mention of names like Zeno, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. All the mention of those names brings back fond memories of sleepy afternoons in Philosophy 101. <laughs> Maybe you had that kind of class. But <laughs> those names, Zeno, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, those are all Greek names. Right? Those are all Greek names. The Greek philosophy, the Greek people loved philosophy, loved to dig into the deep questions of life. You know, that the purpose for human existence, the, the reason for pain or pleasure, the struggle between good and evil, all those sort of deep questions. They, they would love to develop intricate systems of thought to explore those topics. They loved logical deductions and reasonable argumentation. Pursuit of wisdom seems to have been almost a full-time endeavor for many folks in Greece. The, the Gospel writer Luke says this. I don't know if he was exaggerating to make a point or if he was being literal, but he said, the Athenians, people from Athens, the Athenians spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. History and scripture record that deep philosophical discussions were extremely important to the Greek people. We have no problem with that, right? Nothing wrong with deep philosophical debate, logical deductions, nothing wrong with that. But it became a problem for some. For some, it just did not seem reasonable that God would take on a human nature, inflict upon himself the punishment that others deserve, and then declare them not guilty? That just did not seem reasonable. So they rejected that sort of what they would call foolishness. Foolishness. The Greeks rejected this most wise message of all in their thirst for logical deductions. Well, friends, we may or may not have many Greeks living in our neighborhoods. But we certainly live in a culture that is focused on reasonable, logical conclusions. Let me give you an example just from last week. Last week I took a, a vacation down to Amarillo, Texas. We went to the second largest canyon in the U.S., Palo Duro, for a week of hiking. Well, one day, instead of hiking, we decided to take a Jeep to work. Down to the bottom and back up again. Oh my goodness, I was quite excited. But our driver slash guide would give his commentary a spiel as we uh, toured the canyon. <laughs> and he would comment on the, the millions of years that it took to form this canyon. 
And he became aware that I was a pastor, retired pastor. And so he asked me, so what do you think about these millions of years? I said, well, I believe in the six-day creation. And he said, well, could each one of those days have been six million or six billion, take your bet, uh, years? And I said, well, Genesis chapter 1 says there was evening and there was morning the first day. Evening and morning the second day. So I believe in a six-day creation. But he wasn't buying it. It did not seem reasonable to him, logical. He rejected it. People in our culture are searching, friends, for a logical, reasonable system that answers the deep questions of life. You know, where did people come from? Is there a purpose for life? If so, what is it? Is there an afterlife? If so, how do I get in? You know, people are wrestling with these questions. Some of the people you come into contact with, some of your neighbors perhaps, or their co-workers, they're, they're trying to make sense out of life. They are on a hunt for meaning. Absolutely. And you have the answer. It's Christ crucified. And you have a perfect opportunity to share that message coming up. You notice that, that I titled the, the message, We Preach Christ Crucified? It's not just I. It's not just Pastor Barlow. It's we. All of us. You see, you come into contact with people Pastor Barlow doesn't come into contact with. You know, folks, that, that the people sitting around here in the sanctuary with you, that they don't know, that they don't come into contact with. So it's essential that you share the message. And you have a perfect opportunity to do that. It's called Easter. Three weeks from now, we celebrate Easter. You know, Easter, like Christmas and Thanksgiving, it's just one of those times where it's almost socially acceptable to talk about your faith. Well, share Christ crucified. One way to do that is to simply use this beautiful invitation that your congregation has uh, printed up there in the, the entryway. It says, uh, celebrate victory with us this Easter, and then on the back it gives all the information about your Easter services. Pick up one of these invitations on your way out there, right in the middle of paper. Pick one up. Don't stick it in the recycling pile when you go home. Give it to someone. Maybe your neighbor. Maybe a co-worker. People will be looking for a place to attend worship this coming Easter. Invite them to come with you. It's one way to preach Christ crucified. And that's what we do. We talk about Jesus. We <coughs> preach Christ crucified. It is a message of power, and it is a message of wisdom. So let's continue to preach Christ crucified. May God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise. <coughs> now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's unite with believers around the world and down through the ages, confessing our faith in the triune God. We'll do so in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian 
We'll go before our God in prayer. We'll include a couple of uh, special prayers today. Carol Black, who's at North Memorial Hospital, and Sherry Beatty, who is having surgery at the end of the month. We will include them in our prayers. <clears throat> well, Holy Spirit, we praise you for pouring out spiritual understanding on Jesus' disciples at the time of Pentecost. You came to them when they were confused and in doubt and taught them what Jesus meant when he told them he would die and rise again. You came to them when they were timid and afraid and moved them to speak boldly about the great things God had done. O oh Spirit, we too have felt uncertain and hesitant. Give us the courageous conviction of faith to speak to others about Jesus as you enable the disciples to do. Let us experience the joy of leading others to discover the way of salvation. O oh Spirit, forgive us for the times we failed to speak about Jesus' love for others because we were afraid. Forgive us for not trusting in your power and for not relying on your word of truth to bring others to faith. Help us remember your promises that when we share the Savior with others, you will be with us and bless us. Today, Lord, we pray for Carol and Sherry. Bless the work of the doctors and the nurses who attend them. In your mercy, grant success to all procedures and let them return to glorify you for your grace. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. And we'll join now in Luther's morning prayer as well as the responsive prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. And taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done.
wonderful messages, mostly, especially at this time of year when we have the chance to do that, to invite somebody to come to our, our Easter services. Please do grab an invitation on your way out and give it to someone. Uh, as 